folks may know Al from either the college or um, from the community players. Uh, he's well known uh, in the area and we're just grateful that he could be with us this morning. So we greet you in the name of Christ on the seventh Sunday uh, after Easter and uh, I'm glad that you are here today. Um, and you know, we're at this point now where we're debating to mask or not to mask, right? <laughs> so um, you do what you feel comfortable with. We are pretty sure that almost everybody uh, that's here has received their vaccines or is in that process. So um, you do as you feel, and, and um, the board will make a decision probably this week uh, on how we're going to proceed. A couple of other announcements, um, most of which are on the back of your bulletin. Um, but I do want to announce that this coming Saturday at 11 a.m., Paula Brown is going to uh, invite all the ladies, I guess gentlemen too, but all the ladies uh, out to the house for our North Wax party. North Wax is North. North. Yeah. What? North Wax. North Wax. Norwex. I think that's yes. what I'm saying. But yes. If not, it's a chemical-free cleaning um, agent, and she had to postpone that earlier, so everybody's invited to that that is interested in those kinds of products. Um, and just be signing up for that art and music camp. Or we've still got lots of time for that, but I want to keep promoting uh, that new venture that we're going to try and we're going to have an awfully good time so I want you to be a part of that, that great time with children. So um, the rest of it you can kind of peruse on the back of your bulletin this morning. So with that I'll ask um, Sharon to lead us in our call of worship. <clears throat> Thanks and praise to you Jesus Christ, King and Lord of all, given the name above every other name. Jesus, Jesus, King and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. King of righteousness, King of peace, enthroned at the right hand of majesty on high. Jesus, Jesus King and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. Great high priest, living forever to intercede for us. Jesus, Jesus King and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. Pioneer of our salvation, you bring us to glory through your death and resurrection. Jesus, King and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. Every knee bows to you, every tongue confesses. You are King of kings and Lord of lords, to the glory of God and the Father. Now we have a praise medley. His name is Wonderful, 174. Majesty, worship His Majesty, 177. It's 176. <laughs> My error, 176. Okay. That's, that's, it'll be up on the screen.
No, just the majesty. Okay. And while most kings 
surrounded themselves with servants, he chose to be a servant. He could often be found helping others. That's backwards. As time went on, people became very unhappy with their king because he just didn't act the way they thought a king should act. Instead of riding into town on a big white horse the way other kings usually did, their king rode into town on the back of a donkey. Was that any way for a king to act? That's backwards. And the people he chose to be his friends. His closest friends were a bunch of fishermen, smelly fishermen. And he could often be seen visiting with the poor and eating with sinners. That's backwards. Finally, the people decided that they had put up with this king long enough. If he couldn't act the way a king should act, then they didn't want him to be their king anymore. They made a plan to have him arrested and thrown into prison. That's backwards. Their plan worked. When the day came for his trial, the king stood before the people instead of shouting, Hail to the king! Long live the king! They shouted, Crucify him! He's not our king! Crucify him! That's backwards. So they crucified the king. They nailed him to a cross. They put a crown made of thorns on his head. They poked him with sharp sticks and made fun of him. What a way for a king to die. After he was crucified, they took his body and put it in a borrowed tomb. That's Edward. But wait, that's not the end of the story. Remember, this backward king was different. The king grows from the grave to live forever. And now, instead of being the backward king, he is the forever king. He's the king to anyone who chooses him to be their king. Oh, there are still some people who call him king backward, but those who know him don't call him that. They call him King Jesus. <laughs> Let that be our King. <laughs> Jesus wants to be our King. If we choose him to be our King, then we will live blessed forever and forever after. Praise be to Jesus, our true King. Please remain seated as we sing, We Will Glorify the King of Kings. And it's in the Faith We Sing, 20, 87, Front Street.
gospel of light and life, which really talks once again following Easter time and the, the great journey that Jesus took on. Today we find ourselves in the arrest of Jesus and the trials of his crucifixion. Here John's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 14b through 20. Pilate said to the Jewish leaders, Here is your king. The Jewish leaders cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate responded, What? You want me to crucify your king? And they responded, We have no king except the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. The soldiers took Jesus prisoner, and carrying his cross by himself, Jesus went out to a place called Skull Place in Aramaic Golgotha. That's where they crucified him. And two others with him, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a public notice written and posted on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Let's look first today at the arrest of the king. It was late Thursday night of what came to be known to us as Holy Week. Jesus and his disciples left the upper room and made their way down Mount Zion. They passed the temple, they walked through the Kidron Valley to a garden that in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is called Gethsemane. It's at the base of the Mount of Olives. It was around midnight. There in Gethsemane, Jesus was arrested. So as we've been doing, let's take some note of the differences between the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the Gospel of John, which is our focus. When Matthew, Mark, and Luke describe Jesus' arrest, the focus is on Jesus' human agony. Keep that in your mind. Human agony. Mark tells us. Jesus began to feel despair and was anxious. Jesus said to them, I'm very sad. It's as if I'm dying. Stay here and keep alert. Then Jesus went a short distance farther and fell to the ground. Jesus prayed that, if possible, he might be spared the time of suffering. The Gospel of Matthew parallels Mark's account. And Luke adds that Jesus was in such anguish that his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. But John doesn't include any of this. He merely says, Jesus went out with his disciples and crossed over to the other side of the Kidron Valley. He and his disciples entered a garden there. That's all John says. Why didn't he include the story of Jesus' anguish in the garden or his prayers that let this cup pass from me? It's because in contrast to the synoptic gospels, focus on Jesus' humanity and his anguish John's Gospel stresses Jesus' divinity. John doesn't show Jesus in agony in the garden. John knew that Jesus was the king, firmly in control of his destiny. Jesus was the divine who with strength and dignity approached his destiny. 
He chose. Only in the Gospel of John are we told that a cohort of Roman soldiers came to arrest the unarmed Jesus. A cohort was approximately two to six hundred soldiers. Can you imagine, can you picture 200 to 600 police officers having to arrest someone? Why did John mention the size of the arresting force? It's likely intended to show us that the perceived threat that Jesus represented, John reports what took place next. Jesus knew everything that was about to happen to him. So he went out and asked, Who are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus said to them, I am. Judas is betrayer was standing with them. And when Jesus said, I am, the soldiers all shrank back and fell to the ground. The words I am in Greek, as we have talked about, are roughly equivalent to the Hebrew word Yahweh, the personal name for God. That means I am that I am. Or I am life itself. I am being itself. When Jesus spoke that name, the soldiers shrank back and fell to the ground. John intended for us to understand that Jesus was identifying with God. John captures the authority and the courage and the hidden identity of Jesus. In the garden, the 600 soldiers shrank back as Jesus, the mighty king, willingly presented himself for arrest. This was hardly Jesus in anguish or throwing himself on the ground or asking for the cup to pass from him as he is portrayed in the other three Gospels. In John's account, Jesus said to his disciples, Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Both portrayals of Jesus are important. The human identity is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the divine identity in John's Gospel. John wants us to see that Jesus was in complete control of the situation. Now let's look at the trials, plural, trials of Jesus. How many were there? Actually, there were three. And like what is described in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in John's Gospel, Jesus didn't appear before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. He only appears briefly before Annas, the former high priest, and then he appears briefly before Caiaphas, the reigning high priest. A very little is said about these trials, except that the priests agree that Jesus should be executed for claiming to be the Son of God. And then Jesus is bound over to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of the region. Pilate's job was to maintain the peace of Rome. The charge that the high priest made against Jesus was insurrection. Jesus was claiming to be king of the Jews in rebellion against Rome's Caesar. Insurrection was punishable by death. This charge sets up the theme of Jesus' kingship. So hear what John chapter 18 has to say. Pilate went back to the palace. He summoned Jesus and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own? Or have other people spoken to you about me? Pilate responded, 
I'm not a Jew, am I? Your nation and its chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My kingdom doesn't originate from this world. If it did, my guards would fight so that I wouldn't have been arrested by the Jewish leaders. My kingdom isn't from here. So you are a king, Pilate said, and Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. I was born and came into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. Whoever accepts the truth listens to my voice. John's account depicts Jesus as king, whose kingdom is not like those of this world. It's a kingdom that transcends geographic boundaries and even transcends time. It's a kingdom made up of all who believe in Jesus, all who follow Jesus and seek to love God and love neighbor. It's a kingdom of truth, of light, and of life. When John describes Jesus as king, his hope is to persuade his readers to accept Jesus as their king, to persuade us to accept Jesus as our king. Jesus' kingship comes before our earthly political allegiances. Jesus demands our highest allegiance. Jews often address God in prayer with these words, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. So when we address Jesus as Lord, we're using a term that reflects authority and rule. Rome's Caesar was addressed as Lord as well. John understands that Jesus is the Lord of Lords, capital L, little L, Lord of Lords. Followers of Christ are actually citizens of two kingdoms. Most of us, probably all of us, are citizens of the United States. We love our country. We're willing to die for our country. But as we know from history, nations come and they go. The kingdom of God, though, is an eternal kingdom. So our primary allegiance is to Christ, our King, and to the kingdom of God. In Jesus' trial before Pontius Pilate, again and again, Pilate said, he found no basis for putting Jesus to death. But the crowd, including the religious leaders, <coughs> demanded Jesus' crucifixion. Would Pilate do the right thing? Or would Pilate do the politically expedient thing? Pilate knew what the right thing was. It was to release Jesus. But he didn't do it because he was afraid. What would it do to his career if he let Jesus go? What would it do to his stature. In this account, Pilate represents all of us. Because at some point in our lives, we will face trial. We will face a test much like this. What will we do when we're given the choice? Will we choose Christ? Or will we choose career? Will we choose Christ or status? Will we choose Christ or money? What is the trial that each of us face? In a very real sense, this wasn't Jesus' trial at all. It was the trial of Pontius Pilate and the religious leaders. Pilate stood in conversation with the king of kings, and he sensed that this man was more than he seemed, and he referred repeatedly to Jesus as king. 
Yet, because of Pilate's concern for himself, he set Christ to die. Pilate may have helped his political career, but he failed the test. He failed the test. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when Jesus is set to be crucified, he is unable to carry his own cross. And so Simon of Cyrene is pressed into service and forced to carry it for Jesus. But in John, we read, the soldiers took Jesus prisoner. Carrying his cross by himself, Jesus went out to a place called Skull Place in Aramaic Golgotha. And that's where they crucified him. Why do you think John emphasized that Jesus carried his own cross? John seems to want us to see Jesus as the strong and dignified Son of God. In crucifixion, the vertical portion of the cross is called the stipe. It was kept at the site of the crucifixion. But victims were forced to carry the horizontal portion, a 70 pound crossbeam. It's called the petitbelum. Jesus picked up the heavy crossbeam with strength and intentionality, according to John's Gospel, changing it into an instrument of salvation. It's as if Jesus is saying, this is not only the instrument of my death, but also the instrument of my mission. The Gospel of John writes, it was about noon on the preparation day for the Passover. It was about noon on the preparation day for the Passover. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus was crucified on the first day of the Passover. And in the morning, John tells us Jesus was crucified at noon on the day of preparation. One day before the full day of Passover. As always, the different details in the Gospel of John are things that we should pay attention to. In this case, there's a difference of time and day. When Jewish friends celebrate the Passover, they are commemorating 1,300 years, the event of God with the Israelites in Egypt, 1,300 years before the birth of Christ. We know from our Old Testament stories that the Israelites were captives in Egypt and that God sent Moses to convince Pharaoh, the Egyptian Pharaoh, that he should release the slaves, God's people. But Pharaoh refused. And then we, we remember that God, God sent plague after plague, trying to force Pharaoh to relent. And Pharaoh still refuses. The last of the plagues was the death of the firstborn children and animals throughout Egypt. On that night, the angel of death would pass through Egypt. But God offered his chosen people, the Israelites, a way to identify themselves as God's people and thus be spared this terrible plague. God told the Israelites to slaughter a lamb, to roast it and eat it, they were then to take some of the land's blood and using a hyssop branch, sprinkle the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. And then the angel of death, seeing that blood, would pass over the Jewish houses, sparing their children and animals from death. That night the Egyptians were so decimated by the plague that they released the Israelites and sent them away. 
following that night, God commanded Moses to have the Israelites mark their deliverance with a, a meal, the Passover Seder. Each year on the day of preparation, a day prior to Passover, the Jewish people would slaughter one lamb per household, and the meat would be roasted and shared in celebration of God's deliverance, salvation, and liberation. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this Passover Seder becomes what we call the Last Supper. And the lambs have been sacrificed and prepared earlier on the day of preparation. But in John's Gospel, Jesus is crucified on the day of preparation. So why does John tell us that Jesus was crucified as the lambs were being slaughtered? Because John wants his readers to see Jesus as the Lamb of God. In the first chapter of John, verse 29, John has already introduced this theme when he writes that John the Baptist looks at Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' ministry as he's being baptized by his cousin. And he announces, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. On that first Passover, so long ago, the lambs were slaughtered not to take away sin, but to spare the firstborn of the Israelites from death. From that time on, the lambs were slaughtered at Passover as a visible reminder of God's deliverance of Israelites' children from death and the Israelites' people from slavery. This is part of what John wants his readers to see. Jesus, by his death, delivers us from slavery to sin, and Jesus frees us from the fear and power of death. Let's look at the crucifixion of our king, according to John's Gospel. The soldiers took Jesus prisoner Carrying his cross by himself, he went out to a place called Skull Place in Aramaic Golgotha. That's where they crucified him and two others with him, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a public notice written and posted on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Every criminal who was crucified had a sign that named his crime. The sign over Jesus read, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. Only the Gospel of John tells us that this inscription was posted in three languages, Aramaic, the language of the Near East, Latin, the language of the West, and Greek, the language of the Hellenistic world. These were the languages of the Roman Empire. These were the languages of the world. In the very inscription meant to name Jesus' crime, the Roman governor, Pilate, inadvertently became the first to declare that Jesus is the king not just to the Jews, but to the whole world. Here on the cross, Jesus is enthroned and his glory is revealed. He is a king who embraced death to save his people. We're meant to wonder and reflect in awe. What kind of king would willingly give himself as a ransom, an offering, of redemption to save his people. The Gospel of John goes on to tell us that Jesus hung on the cross. Those nearby offered him a drink of wine, of sour wine, like a vinegar. They affixed a sponge to a hyssop branch. 
dipped it in the sour wine and raised it to Jesus' lips. But hyssop isn't just any branch. Listen to Moses' instruction to the elders of Israel on the night of the first Passover. Go pick out one of the flock for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood that is in the bowl, and touch the beam above the door and the two doorposts with the blood in the bowl. Hyssop was used to ensure that the children of Israel wouldn't die, even as they were being delivered from slavery. So once again, John's Gospel is seeking to make it clear that Jesus came to liberate us and save us from death. And the hyssop branch is one of the several clues and symbols that John uses to that end. But there's another use of hyssop in the Old Testament. Hyssop branches were used in rites of purification. It became associated with God's work in cleansing the people. If you remember from Psalm 51, the King David would say, Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Jesus the Passover lamb sets us free from slavery. And Jesus the king sacrifices himself to purify God's people and to save them and us from sin and from death. Jesus sets us free from sin. On the cross, Christ both bears our sin and shows us the way of selfless love. We're slaves to our fear and our dread of death, but by his cross and resurrection, Jesus sets us free from those fears. Perhaps the single greatest form of slavery that many of us experience is our uncertainty that we are loved. Every one of us longs to be loved. And yet many of us have never experienced that certainty. That unsureness leads to all kinds of behaviors and efforts to win love. It begins to enslave us once again. Let's conclude with Jesus' final words from the cross. In Matthew and Mark, his only words from the cross were, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But John doesn't record those words. Jesus did not question God in John's Gospel. He was injured and suffering, and yet he remained strong and determined. In John, the final words of Jesus were, it is finished. Some interpret these words to mean that Christ was exhausted and defeated. But if we look at the original Greek, the phrase is expressed in just one word, teleste. That word is a shout of victory, announcing that a battle has been won, a mission accomplished. It is finished. I won. Victory over death. The mission is finished. It was so for Jesus. And because of that, it is so for us. Join us in our affirmation of faith that Sharon will lead us in. It's in the hymnal on page 887 or up on the screens. <clears throat> Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, 
or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No. In all things, we are more than the conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation. We be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's time for us to lift up our joys and our concerns, and I will share with you uh, this morning that Greg Shankle came to me to tell me that D.C. Shankle passed away this morning uh, from COVID, and that Barb is also in Alma Hospital and not doing well. So we need to lift that uh, family in our prayers, uh, both of them having COVID. But D.C. Shaco passed, and Barb is not doing well. Who else has a joy or concern that they need to lift this morning? My dog. Go ahead. No, yes, I am. Diane. My aunt Jerry Gallagher um, is recovering from her hip surgery, but not doing well. She's in an assisted living facility in Clare. Thank you, Diane. So her aunt Jerry Gallagher is is not doing as well after a hip replacement surgery. Sure. My granddaughter Kayla Hoffman will be having surgery this week on Thursday. My brother-in-law, David, Howie from Florida, which fell off the ladder, is going to be going to the VA this week because he has a pinched nerve that he's going to have to have surgery in. And Lori will have another treatment this week, and she's just getting over the last week. Just having a rough time. So she's asking for prayers for her granddaughter, Kayla, who's having surgery in her brother and her mom. Brother, yes, my brother-in-law, brother David, David, who's uh, having some issues, and um, uh, continuing prayers for Lori, who has another treatment this week. We lift those in prayer. Who else this morning? I'd also like to ask a prayer for my granddaughter, Abby, and my daughter-in-law, Kim, who will have surgery. So prayers for Abby and Kim, part of Ginger's family. Holy One, we come to you seeking, asking, sometimes pleading, sometimes shouting out to you, and we're able to do that because you know, you not only know the needs and the wants, but you know all about the hurt and the pain and the anxiousness and the confusion sometimes we're going through because you know everything about us you know everything about those that we love whether they know you or not you are their creator so we come to you to your throne and ask according to your will for your beloved children that you touch all of us in the ways that are needed for all of us have something that's needed, emotional healing, physical or spiritual healings. And those that we love have those needs as well. So we lift all of that to you and even the unspoken requests that remain in our hearts and minds, we lift those to you as well. Always in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, our King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Let's take the next couple of minutes to just listen to the beautiful music that El Bartholomew brings to us this day. And we appreciate all of your faithfulness.
as we offer our gifts and our very selves to you, receive the offerings as the first measure of our gratitude for all that you are and all that you have done for us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, help us continue to sing a song of gratitude each and every day of our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Join us for the hymn of dedication from the faith we sing, Lamb of God. For on the screen, or in the faith we sing, 2113. Stand as you are able. Dear Lord, I need what you have done. 